is Andrea Sifor joining us from Nationwide to talk about the journey of enterprise architecture, customers, and operations, and how you bring it all together. Andrea has over 20 years of experience building and consulting in quality, process, and information management. She has a proven success in authoring organizational best practices for integration, data quality management, and fitness by design. She is an IASA certified CITAD information architect and is certified in Six Sigma and Lean. She has designed and built a data quality and analysis framework with predictive models, developed and executed data management standards, resulting in reduction of data loss, designed and executed on enterprise level data rationalization strategy and data repository ranking. Andrea, what a privilege to have you with us. We're super excited about your presentation, about learning more about an industry leader and practitioner who is making this happening right now in the organization. Thank you for taking the time to share your expertise with our global audience today. Absolutely, and thank you very much. I'd like to welcome everybody today. Um, good morning, I'm in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm going to talk about, if you notice the very long title that I had, designing a customer-focused governance model that aligns business architecture for competitive advantage and continuous improvement. This is a mouthful and it kind of makes your brain start spinning. So I want to break this down a little bit before I get started. Customer-focused is a tough one. A company exists for a reason, providing services or products. I speak in terms of data. Let's face it, data is the backbone of a company. It's governance. Data is the key to competitive advantage and continuous improvement. The data comes from somewhere, whether recording a click or entry into a text box on a website, purchase of a product or services. Then there's all the stakeholders depending on that information once it has been recorded and processed. In this case, we will be focusing primarily on the stakeholders, not the origin of information. While I might mention safeguards along the way, I am focusing on systems of data and their subsequent life cycles and not a company's customer base. Governance model, and that again, a bit vague and a large concept. When I think of governance, my head explodes into a million threads. It's actually like the New York subway system. So we govern through patterns, principles, security, privacy, definitions, metadata, conformance, quality management. There's a really long list. Um, there is not one governance model to fit the world. At the enterprise level, the answers to each of these concepts can be exponential. Hence, we tend to define governance at the enterprise and functional level. I will be speaking across enterprise and functional terms, but mostly focusing on functional. Business architecture, this is the underlying system of systems that a company depends upon for almost every function of the company. Continuous improvement and competitive advantage, these should go hand in hand. For every dollar you save on systems, infrastructure, process, and time, you lead to one more, one form or another of competitive advantage. It is not just about having the hottest, coolest product or service that drives a successful company. In the end, this is a conversation about governance, data, and driving success for customers, the company, and the true gears of this success engine, which is the data consumer. I'm going to take you on a journey that is an amalgam of many data adventures throughout my career. I will not give, get into why we modernize or conform or integrate, but dive straight into practice and goals with some analogies for today. I will not get into, excuse me, in most companies that I work for, I have seen the top-down approach of governance. If we can define it, place it in a hierarchy and catalog it, we succeed. Don't get me wrong, defining data for common understanding is very important. Standards and policies evolve from examples, roadmaps, as a reactive measure or regulatory, the origin is not important. We all need common guide wires. These concepts help us evolve our data practice. 
there is a dividing line between hierarchical approaches to governance, especially when thinking in terms of day-to-day -day operational engagement. If you look at my slide, I like to build an understanding and definition of governance based on the needs of the data consumers. And so therefore I'm doing that functional governance versus the enterprise. Now enterprise, those are those large ticket items that apply to the entire I, uh, enterprise. Standards, uh, policies, and uh, enterprise tools for data discovery and cataloging, et cetera. But I'm gonna talk about functional implementation of governance. So this is where I diverge from the common tenets of governance. The renegade in me thinks bottom up. Let's face it, unless you are building everything from scratch, you have legacy data, systems, and existing uses for that data. In most cases, prior to my arrival, some executive uh, level groundwork has already been laid. They have charters, goals, budgets, they've set up timelines, et cetera. But nothing really has happened as far as what we're truly trying to deliver. As I kick off a project, I start with a listening tour. Prior to the listening tour, I figure out the org chart, identify the data practitioners, and ensure I have a decent representation of organizational activities revolving around data. Here we go, sorry about that. Um, my questions follow a set of themes, who, what, where, why, when, and how. And as you can see, the Zachman framework is probably one of my favorite tools. Um, it's actually quite common for enterprise architects also. So for me, who is your audience, your consumer? What, those goals, responsibilities, and expectations for an outcome? Where, source of the data? Why, the purpose? When, frequency, span of time, and speed? How, tools, processes, methods, and practices? These are the questions I ask my constituents or those stakeholders that I've identified. As I gather the information, I will identify major processes and arrange to observe. One of the things I like this approach, uh, one of the reasons I like this approach is actually because it allows me to focus on the data consumer and practitioner. They provide the building blocks for a solution. As they walk through processes, discuss schedules, et cetera, they typically expose challenges. These challenges drive a lot of the non-functional requirements. I'm also able to identify missing data, which will lead to new data requirements also. Let's face it, the data practitioners are using data today. If all we do is deliver the same data without improving the experience, we're not driving advantage. Okay. At this point, I'd like to identify a SIPOC. And this is a common Six Sigma tool, supplier, ink, input, process, output and consumer, where we literally string together, well, we, we take individual processes, identify who is giving us the data, where is the data coming from, what kind of data, what's the input, what process does it support, what are those outputs, and who are the customers. By doing SIPOCs, I'm able to stitch them all together and identify the, a lineage. And while the lineage isn't literally about the data handoffs, what it does give me is the relationships of people, teams, and systems across the organization. Now I can determine, hey, have I really found the end of the process or have I really found the start of the process? Um, later on, I like to string these hypocs together and work my way backwards through a data lineage, which will identify those systems and teams, which I've already spoken about. With lists of, uh, so. Going through this process, I identify not only the process, et cetera, but people are very willing to explain to you what the, the challenges are. I take lots of notes. And as I go through these processes, I observe as much as I can. I do a passive observation. I sit behind the person. I just let them do their work and tell me what they're doing. And then as we are able, I'll take a break and actually start interacting a little bit and asking, hey, why did you do that? Is it necessary to open three tools when you might be able to use one, things like that? And that helps me identify some of the gaps or some of the opportunities beyond just the simple challenges that have already been discussed. With a list of challenges, 
I'm able to analyze potential sources and include that in the lineage. This is an ad hoc form of phase leak analysis. In other words, where does the challenge originate? Where should it be identified and how you resolve it and where? So for example, if I have data latency, it's not the data consumer for the most part that's going to be impacted. I'm going to go through this process di diagnostic and I'm going to find out that, you know, based on various metrics, we'll talk about that later, that while the admin system or the, the source system is able to provide the data, there's something that's happening in between an acquisition where the data is not arriving on time or if it actually is at the source. So the next step is to review my findings, the SIPOCs, then stitch together, and then start having the conversation about with those teams that are responsible for the data pipeline. One of the things I've always found fascinating is the relationships that form across the lineage. Typically, I find that the source system team and the subsequent teams responsible for the data are not cognizant of how the data is used or why it's important. That is a very tough nut to crack. But on the other hand, if you're bringing together a group of people, you're reviewing these SIPOCs, then they're gonna start understanding what their true goals are. It's not that they need to get data out of their pipe by 9 a.m or that they need to make sure that they have, you know, heuristically um, expected volumes of data based on the time of day and day. What we're really talking about here is being able to start connecting the dots between these groups and letting them hear each other and the types of challenges they've had. Each perspective adds to a great story that we will later start working with and um, improving processes, et cetera, or designing that new lifeline of data. By reviewing the existing process, we can start defining a future state by marrying the lineage, SIPOX, and challenges. More importantly, a community is evolving. This, this single act drives engagement across the ecosystem toward a common goal. These relationships drive trust, and engagement through the future life cycle of data. This is where we break the mold and start driving consumer first principles. In other words, when a baker understands that the sandwich shop opens at 11 a.m., they know the bread must be there earlier in order to ensure that the first customer gets a sandwich. The sandwich shop will dictate the type of bread and the baker will deliver that. I love analogies because they illustrate commonality. They're logic, logical, and they help us ex explain the problems that we're facing. When I compare a data lifecycle to a common experience, I uproot existing paradigms toward the user of the data. Once upon a time, we've referred to this as IT for business, but never quite achieved that in most cases. At this point, we can define functional and non-functional requirements, identify success factors, and we have identified the stakeholders required for a successful outcome. Not only that, but later on, you're gonna be tapping into this, I'll call it brain trust or community of people to not only you know, further review requirements, make sure we're delivering the right kinds of things, do show and tells, et cetera. They're also gonna help us determine how to test. How are we going to validate that they're getting the same data they used to, but through another process, or that any of the new requirements have been met? Now I'm going to shift gears again, and a role like mine is limited, is not just limited to governance. It expands into data acquisition, process creation, and management, as well as managing quality. I am an information architect. I typically sit between the business and IT, and my role may land on either side depending on the organization. But no matter what, the goals and approach have stood the test of time. The beauty of this approach is reuse. Oops, sorry. As I built the SIPOCs and learned about the challenges associated with the existing data ecosystem, 
I also identified the definition of quality in terms of the evolving community. What's important? Why is it important? I will now focus on the source of trust in data, simply stated, quality. I'm going to compare two, three schools of thought regarding quality. If you do a Google search for the dimension of data quality, this is commonly what data governance people will refer to, is the, is the dimensions of data quality. And if you look on the left on this slide, that's functionality, efficiency, usability, reliability, maintainability, and portability. While most of these focus on the end user, there's also other functions like your reliability, maintainability, and portability. That's very much in your IT shop and in your design. But if you don't listen, if you don't hear what the current challenges are, you're not gonna prevent them from happening again. You're not gonna improve the experience. Next, we go to the dimensions of quality, which um, are identified by ISO. And that's ISO IEC 91261. The dimensions of quality are accuracy, timeliness, precision, reliability, currency, and relevancy. And oops, I think I just swipped that around and I apologize. <laughs> it was the quality attributes are um, your governance, is, is your architectural perspective and your dimensions of quality are the, um, the governance view. But I'd like to go a little bit further actually because ISA groupings, ISA is the International Association of Software Architects. And in fact, that's who has, you know, blessed my um, certification from professional and now distinguished as an information architect. In the ISA groupings, you'll see there's three different types of groups and they have continuity with the other viewpoints from governance and from the architectural perspective or the, you know, the ISO perspective. But what they're doing is they're talking more in depth and they're really showing us the types of quality dimensions and, and management for data. And it gives us the ability to start really talking about what's important to us. It's unfortunate that you can't just have 100% of everything. For example, I wanna have reliability and performance, but I wanna have accessibility, personalization and customizability there's a point where you have to make trade-offs. The architectural quality attributes support governance dimensions of quality, whether directly or indirectly. The issue is mapping the relationships. To expand on quality attributes, you know, we had just talked about that from ISA, the expansion of the ISO quality attributes into these groupings it is not only easier to map against governance goals, but it, it, in most cases, it forms a tangible common language across business and IT goals for quality. Most of the companies I've worked at in my past have been tribal. And one of the first things I'm trying to do is standardize language so that as we're progressing through the project, as we're identifying issues, or as we're re-evaluating our design or, or goals, we have the ability to look at um, and discuss things in common terms. Additionally, if you go back to the Cypox, I can point to something and say, that's where it happens. And so between having common language and you know, graphical images that help us uh, identify where we're at, you now have a common way of talking in any meeting. And, um, I think that's really important to have what I call repeatability, because even from a psychological perspective, that repetition becomes more comfort. It also helps you drive you know, that trust. That community you're developing hasn't existed before in most cases. And if you have everybody working together towards a single goal, i.e., I need my data by this point, I need to report, you know, create these reports, or I need to file these uh, regulatory notifications or whatever it might be, I now have the ability to work upstream when I have a challenge, and I know exactly who to go to, why I would go to them, and when. So you've just given me, as an end user, peace of mind. I now know these people, I trust that they have my best interests at hand, et cetera. 
So based on the, that previous research I did where I did the SIPOX, et cetera, um, I can associate user stories and experience against the quality attributes that we have here and drive a common set of goals throughout that data lifecycle. In most cases, the challenges previously identified will map to the groupings again from ISA. So I'm gonna veer off the path just a little bit right now. And I wanna talk about um, defining quality. I start digging around for operational data and metrics as soon as I can. As soon as I can identify who participates in that data lifecycle, I wanna find out what we currently measure what types of problems we were able to detect. I wanna look for uh, duplicate issues or and root causes, preventative actions, corrective actions, the whole shot. But in order to get there, you have to have that type of, of um, discipline. In a lot of cases, you're lucky when you can find a couple of dashboards. And typically, again, you don't have consistent dashboards across your organization as far as that data pipeline. So that's one of the things that you know goes on my list of things we're going to have to fix throughout this process. The next thing I'm going to talk about um, as I'm defining uh, quality is I'm also executing an agile form of Six Sigma. The principles that I like to use will drive continuous improvement in, in, in this case. So I like this image because it talks about the reality of that life cycle. Um, Demaic, you know, or D is where I'm defining my current data life cycle, identifying my stakeholders, experience, et cetera, as part of that defined stage. M, I am, you know, gathering any metrics to measure current state of the ecosystem, but also to extend the user stories with system evidence. A, again, I am constantly analyzing the evidence, forming hypotheses, and providing insight into solutions. I is driven by the requirements that have been gathered, the metrics and reality, also known as the budget. And then there's control or C. I'm going to jump back on the previous path to discuss quality goals and priorities. Previously, I explained uh, mapping user stories and experiences against the quality attributes. No matter what you see, no matter what you see as the basis of defining quality, the next step is prioritizing the quality attributes. In most cases, priority re relates to purpose. With a logical association, this is a challenge. Stakeholders will agree that quality is important, but define quality based on their perspective. From a systems perspective, I'm going to be thinking about performance, reliability, availability, scalability, security. But from a user perspective, I need to be able to use my data, get to it quickly, align it with my goals, even though the enterprise or source system may not quite conform the data the way I need it. And then of course, there's that maintainability, manageability, supportability, et cetera. The cost of quality for each attribute is exponentially aligned to the degree of the solution. So I was speaking earlier, if I wanna have a billion nines, guess what? I'm gonna to have to give up something and typically that ends up having some consequence with the end user experience. I'm spending a lot of cycles on keeping my systems up, et cetera, and maybe I have to back off on some of the customizability or personalization that I might offer. So again, it's this balancing act and your organization, one of the first things you really need to do before you kick off one of these projects is identify what is the priority of quality and what is most important. As we spoke earlier, from end to end, it's going to vary. And so now we negotiate. And maybe as part of that life cycle, you do focus on something upstream that you may not at the user, uh, the, in the user space. You know, okay, so I'm gonna give you another analogy. So for example, I'm at the sandwich shop and I have a choice between bologna and prosciutto, Wonder Bread or a baguette. And when it comes to those quality attributes, I want to have that prosciutto on a baguette. I want the best sandwich possible. The reality is that I can afford either the prosciutto with the Wonder Bread or bologna on the baguette. And so maybe it's not everything I wanted. 
And don't get me started on condiments or cheese, that just blows my budget right now. So that again will actually illustrate, I love this one because it illustrates the fact that scope creep costs you money and it will reduce what you deliver. So in the end, I'm going to end up with either that prosciutto on Wonder Bread or bologna on a Baghdad. So this is that, again, that perfect illustration of balancing against the quality attributes. Before I move on, I'm gonna talk about failure modes and effects analysis. This is actually one of my favorite tools on earth. I don't know how many times I use this, but at this point I could probably just, you know, talk about this without even doing any research and working on filling in all the, the boxes. This is an excellent tool for identifying the priority areas for monitoring and measurement, as well as um, identifying things that we may or may not be able to fix prior to our releases, but at least it helps us to prioritize. And that's something that's really important because sometimes when you get a big group of people together, it's very difficult to actually come up with that common goal, set of goals. Um, with the failure modes and effects analysis, what you're doing is you're identifying fail, what the type of failure is, what kind of an effect a failure has and who it impacts, the severity and impact, I can't do my job, um, or I am not able to access the data I need for a study. Um, we get to the root cause, the frequency of occurrences, existing controls, and detectability. Now this can be used for existing systems, but what I like to do is I like to use it on my design. And that's what they call design FMEA. And while it has the same types of co uh, content, what you're going to be doing is you have to come up with the hypotheses of what could happen based on your knowledge of other systems. So if you know that you have problems with network load balancers um, and you know their ability to detect whether or not a, a service is running, that's something you're going to put here. And then you'll walk through the process. So if it fails because we're not able to, we're not, the, the, there's not a good communication between the network work load balancer and um, you know, the, the I don't want to forget my words. Sorry, <laughs> but if you you know if you if you're losing track of the data between those two points because you know, the service isn't up, then now I know what the potential effect is. I know what the cause is, and I can actually look at is there anything that controls that? Is there a fail safe in there that'll prevent the failure from happening? I'll identify any of those. And then I look at additional recommended actions. When we start working on this, you have a group of people, and I tend to start with each of those, I'm gonna call them silos for now, just because they typically are. But I'm gonna start with, okay, who's the, who works with the uh, admin system or the source system? Who works on ETL and data distribution and management? And then who is working with data consumption yeah, or I'll say, actually, let's go back. Data modeling, data, you know, your data repository, and then your end user. By walking through this with them, we can identify from ex from experiences. Um, one example is if a if your end user is experiencing latency in data, then we can drive it back through that SIPOC, identify the location where this most commonly happens, especially if we have metrics. And then we're able to start working on how do we prevent this from happening. Um, but if it's only something that happens once every two years versus something that happens every month and when I'm trying to run my books, that's going to play in. And we have this thing called an RPN, or a risk priority number, which is the output of this process. And while that's not a rational number, the RPN is another form of prioritization. And it helps you look at, from all different perspectives, once I tie all that feedback together and compile a final FMEA analysis, I can work through with all of the stakeholders and make sure we all agree on the RPN. Sometimes we may adjust it a little bit based off of, you know, well, you don't understand the impact it has on me, or you don't know, you know, I, I don't know if we've actually hit the right 
root cause. Um, but by uh, streamlining that and cleaning that up a little bit, we actually get to yet another tool, another visual, and another set of language that I can communicate, refer to, and again, drive, uh, drive the priorities of the project. It is important to remember that no matter how much pre-work relating to quality design you do, circumstances change. This can lead to new areas of focus and measurement and a change of priorities. That is all part of continuous improvement and a byproduct of control. So remember how I kind of took a break from control, we're back. So as I head to my conclusion, I wanted to return to the goals I had. I wanted to talk or have a conversation about governance, data, and driving success for customers, the company, and the true gears of this success engine um, for the data consumers. By focusing on all the contributors, but starting with the consumers, you have the ability to relay stories and experience and share, sh share ideas uh, and identify those priorities in a way that anybody along that, that community is able to understand. Now we join together and we care about the experience of the end user. And that truly is going back to, remember I said IT for business? It means that while I have all the needs, et cetera, I'm going to tell you what they are. You're going to give me a solution, but you're always going to keep me in mind in order to make sure or negotiate what the solution may be. So while the, um, so I just want to go back and say, you know, this had the potential for being a very huge topic. I could talk about any one of these concepts for a very long time. Um, so I tried to focus on the approach, give you some examples, and, uh, and, you know, driving towards that quality and governance goals into the design process while ensuring that the deliverers will meet the needs, priorities, and goals of that data consumer. The perspectives I have shared focus mostly on quality. To me, this is the ultimate deliverable in an information architecture and a solid driver for governance and is illustrated by comparing quality attributes, dimensions of quality, and the ISO groupings. We have not addressed other functions of governance, such as regulatory requirements, privacy, security. These should be defined at the enterprise level. Again, there is a purpose for both the enterprise approach and the bottom-up approach. And um, uh, typically, uh, wait, yep, so typically if we focus on top-down governance, we tend to lose agility. But while governance is a form of control, we need to govern in an adaptive manner. And that is where we go back to the beginning and talk about that enterprise governance. Again, the rules, the frameworks, the structures, et cetera, but functional governance is for the people. It engages the people. And by having engagement, by knowing who is part of your lifeline of data, you now build trust and trust goes a long way. Thank you. Excellent, Andrea. Thank you so much for that. Uh, for sharing the, your expertise there and your journey, uh, you're in a very you're in a very unique position, uh, and I'm looking at the comments here from the audience. You're in such a unique position because you're actually the director of actuarial data governance for you know a, a large insurance company. You're living these things you know day in day out. Um, if you look back like a few years back when you started on this role and you and you got into the organization, what are some of the things that you that you learn right away that you thought that needed to be done differently and you start building in the really aligned with the models that you share with us? So I won't know and people don't really just give that information up because I think it's hard to express the pain you have unless you're going through it. And that's why the listening tours are so important to me. I get to not only hear from them in terms that they use on a daily basis, which helps me understand their language, but I also get to see, I watch, I observe, and then I can identify a lot of opportunity for improvement. And uh, what are some of the things that you felt that, you know, without, of course, you know, getting too specific on the, on the, on the people and the, and the business, but what are some of the things that you found through these listening tours that, uh, that really 
uh, helped you a lot along the journey and that uh, were maybe not obvious from looking at data, you know, or looking at process designs? Um, what are some of the insights, you know, that, that you gather from those? So I, I like to look at the concept of user experience. Um, you know, a lot of the times when we think about user experience, it's about interfaces, you know, frameworks, things like that. But it's also about anything that you consume, especially in terms of like data. And if you're not able to do what you want with data and you're doing a lot of manipulation, et cetera, that's not to your best advantage. The more you humanly touch something, the more likely you are to actually not be able to repeat a process. So those are a lot of, that's a lot of what I look for is what is actually in the process from the very bottom beginning all the way back. For example, if I don't get alerts that there's a problem on my system and I have to just, you know, eyes on glass, keep on monitoring something, I'm going to miss something when I take a drink of my coffee. So those are the types of opportunities I'm going to look for from a procedural perspective, from a systems perspective, tools perspective, et cetera. And that's going to help me make sure that what was defined as the goals of the project actually align to the experience and what we're trying to solve for. And, and uh, um, Andrea, on following up on that, as you, governance is hard because governance, you know, has multiple levels, right? As you know very well, um, you can be look. you talk about enterprise, you talk about function, uh, you know, you have, on, you have to establish ownership at so many different levels, at the data level, at the process right. level. And, uh, and ownership is something that um, uh, sometimes it's hard to nail down because in large organizations, because everybody has their finger on something and uh, either too many people want to own it or sometimes nobody wants to own it. <laughs> and, uh, and Absolutely. So I mean, the question is, how how do you collaborate effectively and navigate, you know, this dangerous uh, waters of ownership and establishing ownership? So what's very interesting about the approach that I have is often, you know, you take a, a life cycle of data and you already have these, you know, groupings of people. But, um, and I like to call them my silos in, in the original um, state, but they don't really talk with each other. And so I might be overcompensating for something I'm afraid will happen later on, or your data consumer may have had a problem at some point and now I'm compensating for that. I like to look at that entire, you know, end to end. And then, first of all, again, standardize the language, give ourselves something we can look at, point to, and talk about our experience together. And that's where, you know, um, first of all, just the Zachman framework is going to help me a lot with understanding who, what, where, why, when, et cetera. But those SIPOCs are critical. That is how I literally can show you, this is my process, and this is what happens. And you now understand that. I go from that, I stitch them together, and then I start looking at what is what is quality defined as based on what I'm hearing. And then I read that back and make sure that everybody agrees. Now we're, we're ad addressing concepts, we have common language, we have diagrams we can point to, which I tell you, when I'm an analyst and I'm talking to an infrastructure architect, that is a really hard map to make. But if I can point to things and talk to things, we eventually end up with an understanding. Andrew, another question that came up here is that there you are a few years, five to six years ago, you started you started nationwide nationwide insurance and you're doing data governance and the you know, you're you're get, kind of getting things aligned and getting them in the right place, and then bang, a global pandemic hits you. And <laughs> yes. the question is, now all of a sudden, some of the governance items that we had have to be different because of the of the remote work and all these different uh, you know adjustments that we had to to make. How has that affected you, and how have you kind of adjusted to this to this new um, new way of being? So this is really interesting. Um, one of the things I didn't talk a lot about, but is really important, is by understanding what the requirements are, the needs are, et cetera, you're able to build a lot of things in. And one of the things we built in was the flexible ability to measure and monitor. Um, 
So for example, data quality is probably one of the most important things to me just because I've, I've been on the receiving end and I want to trust the data more than you trust the data if you're consuming it. Um, with that being said, um, we actually had a little bit of a bump as a team um, in the beginning, but we took quite well to being remote and um, again, it came down to, I had, a, you know, we've established a language which we can speak in. We've identified who we need to go to at each, you know, from end to end. All of that was defined and being defined during the pandemic. And it actually was the backbone that kept us all together. Now I have, you know, if I have data quality issues, if I see an alert thrown, et cetera, I know exactly who to go to, how to manage it, how to communicate it et cetera, we have common practice. All of these things were built in along the way so that when we actually delivered data to the end user, the thing we were focusing on was their adoption. So the, the remote work did not significantly change the governance and the structure you had? Not at all. And actually, it's strange, but we kind of question Right now, you know, you have you still have some social distancing in Ohio. We're allowed to take our masks off, but only if you're fully um, vaccinated. And so one of the things that's very interesting is we feel like we're less connected now because we all come into the office, we sit at our desks and go on video calls. <laughs> that is great. You know, yeah. this is I love that comment. It's so true. I've I've been hearing that from a lot of the organizations that we work with that I yes. feel so lonely here in this office now because yes. I don't get to interact with the same people. Now uh, we can like see faces and smiles, but we've missed that. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is such a big deal. As a matter of fact, I'll put a plug. Our next conference is actually on the digital workplace transformation. And this we're gonna tackle this process, this this item head on for three days and uh, in later in the third week of July. So, because as you said, it's not, you know, it's uh, people, I think once your perspective gets shifted, um, it uh, it may never go back to what it used to be. Yeah, it's very interesting. And, you know, we're trying to figure out how to, you know, work together in person again. And we find that, you know, the week, we, we have a hybrid model. So we're in the office this week, next week we're at home. We, I feel like we're more effective at home, but, um, you know, it's adjusting. And yeah. um, the pandemic was a good wake up call for a lot of us in the way that we work and identifying like, hey, how late do I really have to stay at the office? How do I manage my work better? And the most important thing that we learned is you take a lot of micro breaks at home. You don't do that at the office. Yeah, true. I have time for one more quick question here. And this one came up in the commentary and I want to I make sure I, I, I hit it on. Um, you talked about, uh, during your presentation, you talked about, you know, developing trust in the data, uh, which is an interesting concept, right? And it's, it's not trivial. No, it's the <laughs> most important thing. you trust the data? It requires governance, it requires processes, it requires ownership. I mean, a level so that you can trust the data. So uh, the question is that how, you know, in, I mean, an insurance company, actuary, data, data services, I mean, you've got to trust the data. So the question That's is, cool. Give us some tips on how do you build and sustain trust uh, with your data? So the approach actually is meant to build that trust and build the relationships. Again, I keep on referring to the community of my data life cycle, right? Um, by asking people questions, by observing, first of all, they, under, they know that you understand what they do. And actuarial function is not simple, let me believe me. But on the other hand, you know, as a data person, I can understand what they need. And I can also understand how hard it is to do some of the work that they're doing. Um, going, you know, further upstream and further upstream, you start introducing each other. And now you do, you build that community. And now I trust individuals. Trusting individuals is a big part of the deliverable. I have the ability to communicate consistently across the group. We are able to sit down and talk about problems. I gave them a lifeline. For example, the actuaries have a lifeline. If they need somebody, they need help writing a query or something's not performant or whatever it might be, they have somebody to answer that question. We have communications and alerts and that's a subscribable entity. Therefore, depending on how much you wanna know, you don't have to know more than that. Um, so by building the community, starting out and building the relationships in the beginning, 
you have trust with individuals. And again, that leads towards, you know, that trusted data. We have met their needs. We have given them the lifelines and we try to simplify their day. And that's one of those things that actually, you know, it will change over time. We will have continuous improvement activities in the future. Andrea, thank you so much for giving us this insights from a real practitioner standpoint. Uh, we appreciate that very much on behalf of our global audience. We want to express our gratitude for you to take the time to do that. Thank you very much. And I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Bye. Ladies, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, Andrea Siffer, Director of uh, actuarial, actuarial Data Governance and Nationwide Insurance, a true leader and practitioner uh, in the area of uh, data governance. And uh, what a great conversation with Andrea. We are going to be wrapping up day one right now, but I want to talk to you about what's coming tomorrow. So you can access the agenda. We have posted several times on the chat the link for that. But I'm going to do a quick preview here with you. We're going to start tomorrow same, at the same time, um, uh, 8.50 a.m. Uh, U.S. Eastern Time. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to kick off tomorrow. Brian Raffle is going to be doing the introduction tomorrow for you all for the first session. I will join everyone after the sex, second session. And on the first session, we're going to have the Senior Vice President of Customer Success of, from Lean IX. Talks to uh, talk to us about how APM and software as service as a service management can benefit from each other. Um, he's going to be followed up by the leader at Biz Design, who is going to talk about faster, better decisions to unlock organizational value. And then we're going to have two world-class practitioner sessions. One coming from the leader of innovation and digitalization at Roche, directly from Europe. Uh, Alan Bendos is going to talk about from issues to innovation, developing a composable business architecture to drive innovation and improve resilience. Roche is an incredible journey to accelerate excellence and innovation in the biopharmaceutical industry. So it's a very comprehensive uh, insights on what that looks like from inside the company right now. And then we're going to wrap up with a super interesting presentation from Rakesh Patel. Rakesh is an advisor for and consultant for the London Metropolitan Police. And uh, he's going to talk about the data-driven approach uniting the processes around digital transformation, technology excellence, and business priorities and social priorities when it comes to the London Metropolitan Police. So very, very interesting uh, industry leaders and true practitioners sharing their uh, insights on on enterprise architecture, architecture directly with us. So I want to thank all of you for joining us today. We had fantastic interaction and questions throughout the day. I expect no less from you tomorrow because you're a wonderful audience. Uh, for those of you who want to follow up on some of the discussions we had here, you can look under my name, Jose Piers, on LinkedIn. I have a post in there where you can Thank the speakers. You can ask additional questions. You can see the commentary, what the participants and speakers are saying about the conference. Um, I will post a quick update about what happened this morning, uh, my morning here, whatever you are in the world, different time zone. I'm going to post an update in the next couple of hours under that link. Um, so feel free to you know, comment, like, share uh, liberally, and keep the conversation going, basically, until we meet tomorrow again live on enterprise architecture. As you close the session, uh, there is a pop-up that comes up that you can provide feedback on the session. And I guarantee you that the, co the conference production team listens and reads every one of your comments. So we thank you for that and wish you everyone a great rest of your day. Bye-bye for now.